We proudly welcome artist Samantha Sherry as our sponsor on the How to Love Lit podcast. Sam is a world-class artist specializing in animal portraits. We invite you to check out her work at samanthasherry.com. Tell her Christian Gary sent you. Again, samanthasherry.com. Shriver. And I'm Gary Shriver, and welcome to the How to Love Lit podcast. This is our second episode in our discussion of Mary Shelley and her great work, Frankenstein. Last week, we spent almost the entire time talking about Mary Shelley's fascinating life, and we didn't even get past the age of 18. <laughs> That's true, although we did cover the title, the subtitle, and the quote on the title page, so... That's something. And if you didn't listen to last week's, you should definitely go back and listen to it because Shelley's life is absolutely fascinating and really deserves thoughtful consideration, especially if you want to take her work seriously. And obviously we think you should. But today, without further ado, let's jump right into this book and talk about the letters as well as getting through chapters one through five. And that's quite ambitious. There's a lot to say. It is because last time it was just the title, the subtitle <laughs> and the title page. Some would not call that progress, but it is. <laughs> well, as we jump in, I am going to make a confession to you. Uh Oh, when I read the book, which I did for the first time since the quarantine started. Oh dear. I completely skipped over the letters by Robert Walton in the beginning. I didn't even understand that they were there until I got to the very end of the book. And then all of a sudden there was this new character that was narrating. I know that's really common. And if you're just reading for pleasure, you know, that's just totally fine. You definitely can start any book with chapter one. And when we did the Scarlet Letter, I kind of encouraged that. Uh, But this book is a little different. The first function of the letters at the beginning is to create what we call a framing device for the story. Uh, One way to think of it is like a frame around a picture. And so this is like a frame around the story. Uh, We see this, the best example, of course, is The Princess Bride, a movie everyone should see. A classic. Yes. Well, in that story, you have a grandfather telling a nighttime story to his grandson. Then he opens the book. Uh, And then, of course, that starts the real story. And we change scenes and we introduce this action sequence, which is going to be the story. So that's kind of what Shelley does. And let me just say this. It's so confusing because there's a Mary Shelley and then there's a Percy Shelley. Hopefully, we're going to be able to be able to tell the difference. This is about Mary Shelley for the most part, even though he does come in from time to time. But Shelley does a similar thing, except she's going to complicate it by adding another layer. So we have this multi-strand narrative that metaphorically has been called the Russian doll structure, like the Matryoshka doll. If you look at our Instagram feed on the webpage, you'll see what I'm talking about. Like the Russian doll, where you have the Matryoshka, where you have a doll within a doll within a doll within a doll, We're going to have a story within a story within a story. So the first frame narrative is about this guy named Robert Walton, and he's writing to his sister, Margaret Seville, letters and narrating his experiences as he tries to find this Northwest Passage across the North Pole. So in his letters, we see a little bit about who this guy, Robert Walton, is as a person Then, as we get into the Frankenstein narrative at large, what we'll understand, and I really didn't really understand this until I read this book for the second time, to be honest, is that this guy, Robert Walton, is going to be, in a lot of ways, like our protagonist, Victor Frankenstein. So, and this is why it kind of matters and why it's good to read this. In a literary sense, What Shelley has done for us is created these foils or characters that seem to compare and contrast in some way. Of course, you can't know how they, how Robert Walton compares or contrasts to Victor until you actually meet Victor and hear his story later on. But what we learn about Robert is he is a scientific minded guy. 
he's seemingly noble. He has this noble objective. He wants to conquer the North Pole, a conquest that will be his contribution to the world. He's ambitious. He says things like, you cannot contest the in- inestimable benefit which I shall confer on all mankind to the last generation by discovering a passage near the pole to those countries. We also see that he is willing to go all in. He, you know, pay any price because in doing this, he's doing an awesome service for the world. And he also doesn't overlook the fact that he will be the receiver of much glory, <laughs> if, this, glory. if he can pull this off. He says this, I preferred glory to every enticement. So what you're going to see is as we read the Frankenstein story that there's a bit of a connection. Uh, in that way, these, both of these guys are going to be on the scientific venture track. Another connection is that uh, they're both isolated. Uh, he's a lonely guy, and loneliness is a thing that we're supposed to be noticing. Isolation is a huge deal, and I want us to keep an eye on that as we read this book, they're not the only lonely characters in the story. Uh, and this, of course, is one of those things is a direct reflection of Mary Shelley's own life. I heard one scholar call Frankenstein a meditation on isolation, which I thought was a very interesting turn of phrase because she was making a difference between being isolated or just being alone. And there are lots of passages where people are alone and it's very beautiful, especially when you get into the descriptions about the scenery. But we'll get back to that. Walton feels this isolation because he's out at the end of the world with this mission. His men are losing interest in it. They want to go back. He feels alone. He says this, I bitterly feel the want of a friend. And it won't be long after he confesses this that da 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 in walks our darling Dr. Victor Frankenstein, a like-minded, driven, scientist, man of the age, about the same age, they're both in their 30s, uh, who is and has the potential to be such a friend. So there are actually a lot of similarities in how these two guys are raised. If you're interested in paying attention to that, there is a lot to notice. However... One of the big things that I think you should definitely notice in the Frankenstein na- narrative is that Victor, unlike Robert Walton, doesn't seem to put a lot of value on the relationships in his life. He doesn't make any confessions like we just heard out of Robert. Um, he's not writing a long letter to, to anybody. He doesn't. We don't see any self-revelatory narratives to people back home. He doesn't seem to feel this need for friendship. He's different. And this might matter if we think about it just a little bit uh, later on. I am sure that it will. That's that's (laughs) foreshadowing right there. Okay. Uh, And this is where Victor Frankenstein is going to tell his story. That is the second narrative. But before we jump into that, I did want to ask a question. Is there any reason for writing to Margaret, a woman or a sister, I mean, is this where feminism starts? I'm glad you asked. And that brings me to my final point about the letters. There is a lot in this book in regard to gender roles, gender politics. Lots has been said. We'll definitely talk about that sort of thing. Shelley really has cleverly weaved a lot of different ideas throughout the whole story. Uh, I do think even here at the very beginning, it's interesting that just like Dr. Frankenstein, we'll find out very shortly, Robert has a female presence in his life that serves as kind of an anchor for him, so to speak. It's a sister, not a romantic partner, but what's even more interesting and subtle and fun, I must say, and I think this is the last thing that I want to kind of bring up about the letters because I know we need to move on. So... The sister's name is Margaret Walton Seville. Those initials are MWS. Do you know who else has kind of MWS as their initials? I think that I do. (laughs) Would that be one Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley? Yes. And guess what? The first letter is dated December the 11th, 17 dash dash is how it reads. The last letter is dated September 12, 17 dash dash, almost exactly nine months later. Some have pointed out, and I think it's kind of fun to see, and I believe that it's true, that Mary has written herself into the book. 
See how fun? And she made a gestation period. <laughs> So, it's just pregnant with meaning. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this book is her baby, if you want to see it that way. You could also say it's her monster, if you want to see it that way. You could say that Margaret holds the entire story of Frankenstein in her hands in this book because she is the one who holds the letters. Mary is holding the whole thing together with her hands as she pins it. So it's clever, huh? <laughs> uh, it is. It's, it's amazingly clever. And one of the reasons why we spend time going into the history of the writer is because we always say writers write out of their experience. Out of all the books we covered, she has done the most of in interjecting her actual real life experience into the, into the story in a subtle way. But in some sense... You know, that's the teenager coming at us, like stamping it or initialing it. I always used to do that when I was that age. And I guess if I was a painter, I would definitely do it now. But now I don't want my name on anything that I draw. But, you know, you always want to leave your symbol. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you reminded us that she was a teenager because she's 18 and very cleverly doing all of this. So we had the frame story of Robert Walton. Uh, then they see the monster, although they don't know it at the time. The monster runs off, and then they see and rescue this man who is on the verge of death. He apparently is on a dog sled with only one dog out on the ice. The book calls it a sledge, but um, here in Memphis, we would call it a sled, like what Santa uses. But we don't <laughs> actually have any since we don't get enough snow for any of that kind of stuff. Uh, but regardless, they pick him up, and although he fusses until he finds out that they're actually heading north. And basically, over the course of time, he gets better, and he's going to tell them the whole story that we are about to read. That's the gist of it. And the second narrative, the one that Victor is going to tell, uh, that's the action sequence. And it's the chronological story that we're going to start and that you started when you started on in Chapter 1. So in this narrative, we're in the position of Walton hearing Frankenstein craft his first-person narrative. This is different from the previous position when we're Margaret listening to a brother far, far away. So we're supposed to feel ourselves getting closer and closer to the story, and then when we finally get to hear the monster's narration, we'll be closer in. I also want to point out uh, that first person narratives also mean there is there's an opinion there's definitely a voice and we're gonna see that too but let me point out one other quirky thing and not not so important to understand the text but just a little slam on Percy and I never miss an opportunity to slam that dude Percy Shelley edited this book for Mary and admittedly he did a great job almost all of his edits were stylistic that means that he just kind of like fixed the language, the punctuation, the choice of words, that sort of thing from Mary's original version. However, he did make one significant change in terms of the content of the story. Um, in Victor's, well, let me say this, in Mary's original version, Victor Frankenstein is a lot more dislikable. He's meaner. He's harsher of a character. I don't think he's very likable in the final version, but he's been softened up considerably and very clearly. Percy Shelley's pen name, by the way, was Victor. Mm. No coincidence. Do tell. <laughs> hmm. So he knows, because it's so obvious, that this character, at least in part, is modeled after him. And he kind of wanted to shave off some of those particularly <laughs> rough edges. A little awkward. So another thing, and uh, I'm not sure if Mary wrote it this way initially or if Percy edited it in this way. But I'd like to think it's worth taking a look at. Um, if you look at the introduction of Victor Frankenstein to us as readers, and this kind of cracks me up after you get past the part where he's emaciated and dying, when it describes him, like it describes the character, Victor Frankenstein, this is how Robert Walton describes him. He says this, For my own part, I begin to love him as a brother. He must have been a noble creature in his better days, being now in wreck, so attractive and amiable. Then in a couple paragraphs, he says this, he's so gentle, yet so wise. His mind is so cultivated. And when he speaks, 
though his words are cold with the choicest art, and yet they flow with rapidity and unparalleled eloquence. This is a magnificent man. <laughs> so just like Mary wrote herself in the book, Percy wrote himself in well, the book. Well, at least he allowed himself to be described in this magnificent well, way that's that a this great is a magnificent man. Although Mary finds a way over the course of the book to make the reader less and less enamored with Victor. Uh, the characters in the story, they never become disenchanted with this man. They never stop loving him. Whoever meets Victor Frankenstein loves, adores, and devotes themselves entirely to him. His friends, his family, his wife, and now the stranger. You could say that to know Victor Frankenstein is to love him. Except, ironically, as the reader, you just can't join the party. I <laughs> uh, no. And it, it makes you wonder if Mary Shelley understood that she was able to accomplish that. You <laughs> it's know? quite clever. Anyway, uh, he's the most eloquent man in the world, just like he described himself in the introduction. He says more than that when, later on, Walton goes on to say that Frankenstein has a quality. Although this quality is difficult for even Walton to define. Here's what it is. It's a complex sense of intuition, really. But in his opinion, whatever it is, it elevates him immeasurably above any other person he knew. Now, I don't know if you can get more high praise than that for yourself. No, and it is in the spirit of infinite wisdom and omniscience that the noble Frankenstein is going to begin his story. So we have this magnificent setup of this basically human per perfect symbol of perfection. Uh, because even though he's clearly the most beautiful, the most intelligent, the most eloquent, the most elevated man on planet Earth, he admits at this point he's lost everything. He's been ruined. He's hopeless. He admits that he sees a lot of himself in this new friend of his. So it is with a word of warning that he seeks to tell another man of ambition a story of how a man so amazing as myself, so to speak, finds himself in the North Pole, having lost everything in the entire world, and basically has the most frightening story ever. So, I think it's time. Open up chapter one, and let's witness this horrible fall from grace. Great, let's do it. Okay, I'm going to read the first sentence, and I read sentence one. I am by birth a Genovese, and my family is one of the most distinguished of that republic. Okay, that sentence one, and I want to stop just for a we're, minute. We're stopping already. I mean, <laughs> at, at this rate, it's going to take 22 episodes to finish this book. I know, but there's a lot to set up, and I want everyone to know how to look at this because I think uh, lots of people pick this book up, and they start it, and then they wear out. They don't make it all the way through, and I promise I'll pick up the pace with the analysis, but I want us to set things up so that you can most fully enjoy this most eloquent You want work. to give us a, a Percy Shelley style <laughs> understanding. Exactly right. First of all, where is Geneva? Well, last time I checked Google Maps, it was in Switzerland. <laughs> yes. And what do we know about Switzerland? Well, let's see. There's chocolate. There's watches, banks, um, the Alps. Uh, the Swiss guards that guard the Vatican. I mean, there's a quite a there's quite a bit to go on. It's part of one of the world's most spectacular mountain ranges, the Alps. They're known for being a country of neutrality, especially in times of conflict. So there's a lot that's unique about Switzerland. So what direction are you thinking? Yeah, I guess that wasn't a very specific question, but you still got close. And I want to focus on just for a second. I promise I won't go too deep, but there are actual several settings in this book, and they're all significant for various ways, but this first setting of Geneva is worth pointing out. It's got its own interests uh, of things that make it a particularly excellent setting to start our story. Well, I mean, isn't that basically where she was the night that she told the story? It seems a natural choice, and it's another clear example of her working her real life into the story. Absolutely, but there's a little bit more of a connection here than just that, that really informs the entire book. So Geneva is the home of the great philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He died not too long before Mary was born, and he was extremely influential, really all over Europe, but especially among atheists and religious dissidents. For example, her father, her husband, 
every single person she knew. <laughs> yes, her world. So her world. In fact, uh, since the French Revolution, uh, the spirit of um, egalité, fraternité, all that kind of stuff of trying to end, you know, class conflict everywhere is a big deal. And so there's no doubt that his ideas, they're in his hometown, would have been a huge source of conversation, even as a child as her dad's house, but especially there on that lake. His work, Emile, which is the one about education, her mother's thing, is particularly a favorite of Mary Shelley's. And so I bring this up because once you know what Rousseau's famous for, uh, and you can really kind of lay that out for us, I think the connection of why it matters to the story we're going to be reading here in a sec is super obvious. All right. Well, uh, if you want the long version. No, uh, (laughs) we don't want the long version. (laughs) Well, we get into a lot of this in our episodes about Lore of the Flies because that book really delves into this whole idea. But during this time period, there was a strong argument against the Christian idea in regard to the nature of man. The Christian idea before is that there is evil in the heart of man and man has to be tempered by God and grace and work on being good. And that's just a simplified version of that. So this guy named John Locke comes around who writes lots of political ideas and challenges us with this idea of the tabula rasa or the blank slate. Locke is going to say that man's blank slate, he's just nothing. And society is what will make him good or bad. Rousseau, although he isn't the only one with this idea, but he's credited for it, takes Locke's idea of the tabula rasa or the Blake Slate theory, and he takes it a step further. He says that man is actually pretty much good, really not evil at all. And he even coins the phrase the noble savage to describe that. So he's going to say that man in his natural state is peaceful, good, and selfless, and that civilization is what makes him greedy anxious, selfish, etc. So here's the argument. Are we evil, good, or nothing by nature? Or some people call it the famous nature versus nurture argument. Which is it that defines us? And every year when I have to present the nature versus nurture argument to students, I'll ask them, which is more influential, nature or nurture? And the answer to that is yes. <laughs> what do people think? I mean, what are... Well, whatever their answer are is, it reflects their current biases. Yeah. But there is no doubt that it's the interweaving of the two that, that create, and you can't even begin to understand the impact of the depth of one on the other. Well, I'm sure Mary Shelley would have been saying similar things that night on the lake. Uh, but thank you for that succinct explanation. So if you haven't yet read the first five chapters, uh, you can read the first couple of chapters knowing that that's kind of what you're looking for because what you're going to see is that Victor Frankenstein has the most wonderful life ever. So if anyone is going to be good because of the goodness of their upbringing, here you have exhibit A. There's no one more adored than Victor Frankenstein by his own admission. His (laughs) father is fairly affluent and fairly respected, but not so much. It's not crazy. He and his mothers had a few challenges, but everything ended up going happily ever after. They have this wonderful relationship. They even pick up a foundling, so they're charitable, and they have this little girl named Elizabeth who's basically the same age as he, and they've raised Victor and Elizabeth together. And Elizabeth, by the way, is pretty much a perfect person. She's absolutely stunningly beautiful. Oh, by the way, pay attention to how much they have to call women beautiful or describe them by their physical appearance in this book. That's a thing. Talk about it in another episode. But anyway, what uh, every woman is going to go, what the heck, when they read this, is, is she's described as a pretty present for my victor. I have thoughts about that. We'll get into it later. But anyway, the point to look at for now in chapters one and two is how wonderful is the life of Victor Frankenstein. And let me just say this. She also modeled this after Percy's life because his pers- his childhood was basically pretty perfect too, unlike hers. Uh, You'll see, though, that Victor has great ambitions and devotes himself to these, even as a child. His best friend, Clerval, is interested in the moral nature of things. That's interesting, morality and things of Mm -hmm. good and bad. Elizabeth, of course, is described not just as being beautiful, but she's the living spirit of love. Victor, on the other hand, is interested in alchemy. And what's even a little bit more disturbing than that There's a quote as early in chapter two, when you're going to see Victor say, the world was to me a secret 
where I, which not where which I desired to divine. Hmm. Good choice of words. Divine divinity. Hmm. It's a little pun. <laughs> yes, it is. Does he want to be God? I don't know. <laughs> hmm. So don't we also see a little autobiographical interjection on Mary's part too at the beginning of chapter three with Elizabeth? Oh yeah. For sure. Elizabeth catches a scarlet fever. Her mother tends to her and dies, ultimately making it basically Elizabeth's fault that her wonderful mother is dead. And of course, we know from outside sources that Mary Shelley felt a tremendous amount of guilt personally, although it's obviously false guilt, but she felt guilty uh, that the reason why her mother died was her fault. And even though that's not true, she still felt it. So what's interesting here, uh, besides that, are the instructions that before the mother dies, she's going to give to Elizabeth and Victor. And she says this, my children, my firmest hopes of future happiness were placed on the prospect of your union. Hmm. So there you have it. A deathbed request. I guess there's no pressure there, huh? Uh, And on that note, it's not long until Victor leaves for university, leaving his family and his best friend, Clairval. Oh, yes. Sweet Clairval. We'll talk about him a lot next week because uh, there's things to say, but we need to rush off to Ingolstadt. Did I say that right? You did. Ingolstadt. Gary, in general, why is this an interesting choice for our second setting, the location of college where Victor Frankenstein chooses to attend school. Well, for starters, uh, Ingolstadt is in Bavaria, Germany. And if you have a super highway, like we do in modern life, it's about a 380-mile drive. But obviously, it probably took a couple of days on a train or more back then. And today, by the way, it's most famous for being the headquarters for Audi, the car manufacturer. Now, that's not related to Frankenstein, but we'll throw that in there. But historically, and this does connect, Ingolstadt University, at the time of the writing of this book, had one of the most modern and technologically developed medical schools in the world. They would have had all the equipment necessary for the latest and the most innovative projects, like building a human. (laughs) Everybody's doing it. All right, so, and let me just uh, throw throw this out there to add a little bit of the spooky. Uh, during this time period, it was very common for doctors or medical students to dig up bodies for the study of anatomy. Even body snatching, you know, stealing dead bodies was actually a huge social concern. Nice. Another reason, if I'm speculating, which I am, that Shelley might have selected this setting is because Ingolstadt is home to one other very famous organization, what would that be? The Illuminati. Oh, my. They're in every conspiracy theory, right? <laughs> so, in fact, they say this secret society was actually started on a university campus. So, there you go. Science meets mystery in one spooky place. <laughs> well, Victor attends class, and like most co-eds, he finds a couple of professors that he really liked and identified with. Professor Kemp and um, Professor Waldman are basically two professors whose names come out in this part of the story and they kind of guide him on his path to be able to do great things. Uh, We're also going to see a little glimmer of what Victor is about and what he likes specifically about um, Waldman's lectures. Waldman says at one point when talking about the power of science, he's going to say this, I'm going to read it. He says that they can perform miracles. They penetrate into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places They have acquired new and almost unlimited powers. They can command the thunders of heaven, mimic the earthquake, and even mock the invisible world with its own shadow. All of this kind of stuff inspires him. Maybe even builds what I want to say, like this God idea of, ooh, with science, we can be like God. But crazy enough, and I find this interesting, he never shares, even with these two mentors of his, uh, what he is doing in his own lab. I find it very interesting since we're reporting on this from the 21st century (laughs) about how somebody in the early 19th century is so confident. If you look at the comparative amount of known science between the two time periods, they obviously knew very little compared to what we know now, but yet they're terribly confident. Well, they know all that they know. There you go. (laughs) And I find this interesting and also a mistake on his part. 
Although I don't see that he ever really talks about why all this had to be such a secret, we can speculate maybe it was ego, it was glory for himself, maybe he knew it may be immoral and he didn't want to be told no, but it was and ultimately became part of Frankenstein's problem. From the beginning, he isolates himself from the entire world because of the secret he's working on at the university. And he basically digs in and for two years totally isolates himself into this project, ultimately forsaking every single other person in his life. And this really stood out to me. And I feel like she makes it stand out to you how completely he abandoned these people back home that love and adore him. His mother's dying wish was for him and Elizabeth to ge- to be together, and he ignores her. He completely throws her over, doesn't seem to even care what's going on. By chapter four, he is not concerned about any of that. He's not worried about another single person. In fact, he is thrilled. This is the moment of highest excitement for him in the whole book. He is elated because he has figured out how to create life. And he says this, I'm going to read it. I became acquainted with the science of anatomy, but this was not sufficient. I must also observe nature decay and corruption of the body. Later on, he's going to say, my attention was fixed upon every object, the most insupportable to the delicacy of human feelings. I saw how the fine form of man was degraded and wasted. I beheld the corruption of death succeed to the blooming cheek of life. I saw how the worm inherited the wonders of the eye and brain. I paused, examining and analyzing all the minutiae of causation as exemplified in the change from life to death and death to life, until from the midst of this darkness a sudden light broke in upon me, and a light so brilliant and wondrous, yet so simple, that while I became dizzy with the intensity of the prospect which is illustrated, I was surprised that among so many men of genius who had directed their inquiries towards the same science that I also should be reserved to discover so astonishing a secret. I know that's a lot to read, but listen. And then in the next paragraph, he goes on to say, after days and nights of incredible labor and fatigue, I succeed in discovering the cause of generation and life. Nay more, I became myself capable of bestowing animation upon lifeless matter. And of course, this is going to obviously have this thrilling effect on him. He describes it as delight and rapture. He better enjoy it, though, because that's his, that's all he's going to get. <laughs> <laughs> but Gary, the science, as it's described by Professor Waldman, and now here, this is really ambitious. You know, basically what he's saying is, I can create life. Do we know from a historical perspective what he's talking about and would a contemporary reader of his day really buy this idea of what he's trying to sell? Sure. And of course, the short answer to that is electricity, but more specifically, something they were calling at the time galvanism. And this was a big deal discovery, maybe like man on the moon level or decoding the human genome level. Uh, And the current events were playing on everyone's mind and really causing a lot of fear besides maybe excitement in the minds of a lot of people. And again, to be succinct, uh, there was this Italian scientist named Luigi Galvani. Sounds like a video game character, but he's a scientist <laughs> who, while working with frogs, actually discovered that you could make frog legs twitch if you struck them with an electrical spark. And of course, at this time, electricity was really mysterious and an and unknown technology. and No one really understood what it could and couldn't do. And he's the one that really identified that we have electrical currents even inside the human body. So the word galvanize comes from Galvani's name. To galvanize means to shock into motion. And anyway, Galvani had a nephew, Giovanni Aldrini, who took galvanism a step further. And in 1803, 1803, keep in mind, did an experiment that sent shock waves throughout the ah, world. Is that a pun? Yes. My, <laughs> my humor is electrifying. Oh, it, it's endless. <laughs> I know. It can go on forever. Uh, anyway, so what he did, and this would be totally illegal today, so this is clearly not an endorsement of what we're about to talk about. So there's a man named George Forster who was convicted of drowning his wife and children, and after his conviction, he was hanged. Then Giovanni Aldrini 
gets permission to take the body and demonstrate this new concept of galvanism. So he shocks the body. And according to the reports that I read, uh, the jaws of the deceased criminal began to quiver and the adjoining muscles were horribly contorted and one eye was actually open. Oh my goodness. In the subsequent part of the process, the right hand was raised and clenched. And the legs and thighs were set in motion. Can you imagine watching that? Yeah, they, they looked like he was like opening his eyes and like yes. jumping off. <laughs> uh-huh. And people thought that Aldrini was bringing Forster back to life right before the very eyes. And it was so terrifying that they say a man by the name of Mr. Pass was so shocked he actually died shortly afterwards from the scare. Oh my goodness, that's irony. <laughs> yes, in the worst so, way. That's cl- obviously where Mary got her idea. Well, I, I think it's highly likely. I mean, he had, you know, the experiment was well known before she wrote the book, and it would have been the talk everywhere. And no one knew if this was possible, but it looked like it might be. Um, he did get the dead guy to move. And very similarly to what we read here, except it seems that Victor Frankenstein was able to finish the job Aldrini couldn't do. He uses electricity to shock the living daylights into somebody. Another Another, another electrifying <laughs> pun. Well, this is the moment that science fiction is born. How many movies are going to recreate this scene over and over and over again? The marriage of chemistry, biology, the occult. <laughs> yeah, and I also find it interesting that in every generation, there is a boogeyman out there whether it's technology or a disease, that we're able to create stories over and over again and how they can threaten uh, life. And she's applied that here. And uh, I do find it interesting that Mary Shelley doesn't really dwell on the laboratory stuff very much, not like you see in the movies. No, and this really started coming out when they were doing play versions. The first play version, Presumption in 1823, put a lab on stage. And then three years later, they put another rendition of this play up with a big lab with lots of equipment and and on it goes. So uh, what we see here in the original text is less sci-fi and really a lot more philosophy because pretty quickly uh, Frankenstein kind of interrupts the narrative of the lab experiment uh, to remind us that like this is Frankenstein telling Walton that we're on a boat, it's ice years later, and he's going to say this. How dangerous is the acquirement of knowledge and how much happier that the man is who believe his native town is the world than he who aspires to become greater than his nature will allow. So there's a lot going on. Shelley really is using science to speak to other things and we'll talk what those other things are. Well, we'll develop those out as we kind of go through the book. So let's focus here though. What I really want to focus on is the creature that he makes. I think it's worth reading at the reading the descriptions. And, and when you get to these, uh, it's kind of interesting. It was with these feelings that I began the creation of a human being. As the minuteness of the parts formed a great hindrance to my speed, I resolved, contrary to my first intention, to make the beginning of a gigantic stature, that is to say, about eight feet in height and proportionably large. After having formed this determination and having thus spent some months in successfully collecting and arranging my materials, I began. So then I want to skip on down to where he got these. He's going to say this. Uh, I collected bones from charnel houses and disturbed with profane fingers the tremendous secrets of the human frame in a solitary chamber or rather cell at the top of the house and separated from all the other apartments by a gallery and staircase. I kept my workshop of the filthy creation. My eyeballs were starting from their sockets and attending to the details of my employment. Thy dissecting room and the slaughterhouse furnished many of my materials and often did my human nature turn with loathing for my occupation while still urged on by an eagerness which perpetually increased i brought my work near to a conclusion so he gets these body parts and animal parts that are dead and that's what he's going to use to make this creation Mm, well i mean there's a lot we could say here i mean it's morbidly grotesque He, uh, like you said, uses animal parts and human parts. He's totally obsessed. He deliberately makes it eight feet tall. I'm not sure what he thought 
that was about, but it appears he's so obsessed with his goal of creating life and the glory he would achieve by it that there was not one inkling of thought about the responsibility that it would entail. I mean, how exactly this would flesh out. But I'm pun. (laughs) It doesn't take a whole lot of thought to speculate how things could go awry. And all we see is mad passion. I mean, the only outside voice in this whole chapter is a mention of his father, who he admits is in the background somewhere worrying about his son. But Victor's reckless. And he says, life and death appeared to me ideal bounds, which I should first break through and pour a torrent of light into our dark world. A new species would bless me as its creator and source. Many happy and excellent natures would owe their being to me. No father could claim the gratitude of his child so completely as I should deserve here. I mean, he he doesn't think or doesn't care or doesn't think to care about anything but the power of creating life. Well, Victor obviously hasn't read Paradise Lost or even the first line that or the line that she put on the title Mm. cover. But moving on. And I want to point out that we're going to see Mary Shelley borrow, and I think this is really interesting, from her own pregnancy experience here in the creation of this uh, new life. It's kind of interesting. If you notice how long it takes Victor to make the monster, it, it says in the text, winter, spring, and summer. Let's add that up. Three, 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 nine months. So she talks about how every day that gets closer to the birth, there's an increase of anxiety. She says... I became nervous to a most painful degree. Sometimes I grew alarmed at the wreck I perceived that I had become. And that, I can tell you right now, is a feeling shared by many women. It's the closer you get to delivery. Uh, I'll speak for myself anyway. I felt like I was turning into a wreck. She says this. Now remember, she's saying this. She's writing as a pregnant woman, but but actually he's a scientist making a body in a lab. So she says this, my labors would end soon. This is Victor talking. My labors would end soon. And I believed that exercise and amusement would then drive away incipient disease. And I promised myself both of these when my creation should be complete. And of course, I find this mildly amusing because I felt the same way. Uh, I'll just talk about my first daughter, Anna, when she was born. She was actually born two weeks after her due date. And I could never go into labor. So I kept trying to walk around. You, you feel the wreck like she describes. You feel big. You can't sleep. And then all you think about is, as soon as this baby's born, I'm going to have rest. I'm going to have peace. It's just going to be so easy. I remember those ideas. And of course, how foolish. Because every parent will tell you that what happens the minute that a baby is born? Well, just the opposite. You never sleep again. Ever. For the rest of... <laughs> You have slept once or twice. <laughs> All right. That's true. But it's just this naivete that you, of course, in most people's lives, you find that it's worth it. Well, Victor is getting ready to find out what it's like to give birth to a baby. And it's not what you think it's going to be. And it's also uh, not what Victor thinks it's going to be at the birth of his baby. And finally, we get to chapter five, okay? But let me add just one more Mary Shelley fun fact that I find fascinating. When she was pinning this part about the experience of anticipating a baby, she was actually pregnant and anticipating a baby, which was her third. So she understands both pregnancy and childbirth in real terms. Yes, she really does. And this chapter, by the way, is the climax of the whole book. Uh, Remember, that's the point from which the protagonist can't, go back. And once you give life to a child, once he gives this baby life, there is no going back to the life before the baby. And I keep calling it a baby. It's an eight foot monster, but (laughs) it's a baby. Every parent knows this. Uh, You don't think about it on the front end, uh, but of course she knows it. And from a literary standpoint, it's just interesting that the climax of the book, that ho- that point, which traditionally is towards the end of the book, Shakespeare puts it in Act 3, but Shelley puts it in the beginning. And I believe this is one of those key pivotal passages of the book. And this is such an important part of the text that I think we need to read the whole birth. So Gary, would you read that for us? It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me, 
that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out. When, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe, or how to delineate the wretch with whom such infinite pains and care I had endeavored to form? His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful, beautiful, great God. His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of a lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of a pearly whiteness, but these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost of the same color as the dun white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexion and straight black lips. The different accidents of life are not so changeable as the feelings of human nature. I had worked hard for nearly two years for the sole purpose of infusing life into an inanimate body. For this, I had deprived myself of rest and health. I had desired it with an ardor that far exceeded moderation. But now that I had finished, the beauty of the dream vanished, and breathless horror and disgust filled my heart. Unable to endure the aspect of the being I had created, I rushed out of the room. Well, first of all, notice how Shelley uses all these details in the description of the setting to set it up that it's not going to be all that awesome. It's a dreary night. It's one in the morning. It's raining. It's windy. The candle is burning out. These are like the classic signs of every spooky horror show Mm -hmm. ever. Some are even archetypal. And then it's yellow eyes open. It breathes hard. It convulses. And boom, it's alive. So... I find this passage a little confusing. I mean, he talks about all the separate parts of the body being beautiful, even the hair. Before the monster is born, there doesn't seem to be any concern that it might be ugly. I mean, how much different could it possibly be? There doesn't seem to be any description of vast changes between the monster not alive and then the monster alive, you know, but all of a sudden, instead of being beautiful, it's hideous. So I wonder if he had so focused on the minutia so ardently that he didn't even view the whole picture. Well, his reaction is the most wretched I could ever imagine for whatever reason. I mean, good point. He up and runs away, really? And here we are reminded that this book is written from the first person perspective and that our narrator is unreliable and we shouldn't trust him. His point of view is definitely not our point of view. You're going to be, as a reader, or at least I am, obsessed with the creation, the baby. But Victor is obsessed, well, with himself. He's not afraid of the monster. He doesn't even wait to see if the monster is aggressive or not. He's disgusted. I guess it's the yellow skin. It doesn't turn pink like a baby's like he expected. I don't know. Maybe the lips, they weren't red. Whatever. He freaks out. And then strangely, from nowhere, I find, I don't know where this comes. He has this strange dream about Elizabeth, his dead mother with grave worms crawling in the fowls of the flannel. He has a cold dew. His teeth chatter. His limbs convulse. Oh, come on. <laughs> well, I have to admit, and I, and I know Shelley was also a student of uh, 19th century psychological theory as it existed then. And she predates Freud, but I wonder if she's trying to be Oedipal here with this (laughs) dream about mother, sister, future wife. I don't know. There is clearly a problem with intimacy. But again, it's fascinating to see Shelley using her real-life pregnancy experiences and embedding them in her characters. Modern people could look and have looked at this text and said that Shelley gave the Frankenstein characteristics that today we would call postpartum depression. You know, the the feelings of anger and anxiety and guilt and hopelessness and uh, lack of interest, that sort of thing. You know, it's a problem with attaching to one's baby. Uh, This is all of that in the extreme. And really, we're going to see Frankenstein struggle with all these things for the rest of the book. But she floods Victor with all these and he finds the emotions of childbirth unbearable. This was something science wasn't talking about back in those days, but we know Mary Shelley felt it, and she's brave enough here to use it. Maybe she's saying a man is not tough enough to birth a child. (laughs) 
But I'm not going to speculate on that because I'm sure you would, although I'm sure that that's been said many, many times. Well, we know it's true, and you've made that too easy, but I'll leave it alone. I'll leave it alone because I really want to look at the monster. Uh, When Victor does something that's completely inappropriate for a newborn mother slash father, I guess in this case, the monster does something that is completely appropriate and something every baby does. He speaks, he smiles, and he reaches out for Dr. Frankenstein, his father. I want to read that to you. I beheld the wretch, the miserable monster whom I had created. He held up the curtain of the bed and his eyes, if eyes they may be called, were fixed on me. His jaws opened, and he muttered some inarticulate sounds while a grin wrinkled his cheeks. He might have spoken, but I did not hear. One hand was stretched out, seemingly to detain me, but I escaped and rushed downstairs. I took refuge in the courtyard belonging to the house. Schmuck, you can't read this without feeling such painful sympathy for this really eight-foot-tall baby, this poor child. And of course, Shelley does nothing but build suspense here because we, as readers, are going to be left with this agony of not knowing what happened to the abandoned, neglected newborn. We're not even going to find out for five more chapters. No, no. Instead, we're going to feel how Victor feels, how he's being taken care of. Thank goodness we wouldn't want Victor to suffer. A little bitterness there. (sighs) I know, but you're left with this desperate feeling to find out, what about the baby? And I find this clever because holding out on the reader, what does that do? That makes you angrier and angrier because Victor never cares. Well, we haven't finished chapter five, but we did make great headway today, uh, more than I thought we might there at the beginning. So should we call it a wrap? Yeah, we can finish chapter five because it's going to take a different direction. Okay, good. Well, next week, we'll look at what happened to Frankenstein, I guess, although I find myself not caring that much. But more importantly, we'll find out what happened to the poor, gigantic child. So thanks for listening in today. We hope you enjoyed the second installment of Frankenstein. As always, we'd like to ask you to tell your friends about us, invite them to listen. And follow us on our Facebook page, our Instagram page. Go to our website, howtolovelitpodcast.com. Lots of fun stuff there for readers. Thanks for being with us. Peace out.